So we just encourage you for coming along. We're getting ready for a great day. To our viewers online, we love it that you're a part of our community. We welcome you, if you're ever in our area, to come along and take part in one of these services. We'll make you feel right at home. We enjoy having you here today, and we want you to enjoy the service. So we've really been preparing for you to get a great time and have a great experience. I have a question for you to start with, and as you're growing up at home, you hear f- certain phrases from your parents. You can probably say some phrases that you've heard at home that have just, they, they're so in you because your parents said them a lot, and your home you said them. Uh, you, you might have heard phrases like as dry as a bone, or as dead as a doornail, or something else like that. They're, they're phrases I heard at home. And uh, in Australia, it used to get so dry in the outback and, and so dry in the desert areas that, that animals would just fall over dead. There'd be no green grass. Everything would be brown and, and lifeless. And, and I want you to get a picture of that image of the, the desert experience when I start to share a, a, my illustration for what we want to talk about today. Because there's always an answer for dryness. There's always the life, the rivers of God. So we're going to get into that a little bit today. And uh, we're talking this year about commissioning the dream. That's mean, meaning to us to be positive and proactive about the decisions we can make to go forward in life. You can do two things. You can sit back and let life pass you by, or you can get involved positively with the interaction of our course of events. You can start to look at opportunities as door opens and take those opportunities and step through. When a challenge presents itself, you don't back down. You stand up to the challenge. You be there doing the positive, in, informative things that we need to be doing to take our lives forward. There's no greater way to move forward in life than to think better so you live better. It says that in Proverbs. It talks about that in, in Proverbs 23, 7. As he thinks in his heart, so is he, because we're directed by our inner world so much. So back to our illustration. I lived in the outback of Australia for a number of years teaching. And my first year out in the, the outback of Australia, we saw a drought that lasted six whole months. That was crazy out there. Good for the golf um, course because it was so dry. You could hit a ball and it would go for miles. It's just like hitting a runway. The thing was concrete almost. And uh, it wasn't good when you got on the greens because they were brown. We called them browns out there. They weren't, they weren't a lot. They were lifeless. But it was so sad because a lot of times the sheep and the animals would just fall over dead. And after six months, one sheep wasn't even worth the price of a 22 bullet, a, a .22 caliber a bullet it wasn't even worth 20 cents and so what the farmers were doing was they would come along in their large tractors and they'd dig these long ditches and uh, about six eight feet deep and very quite wide and but they were very long and what they would do is they just grab the tractors and the, the, and the sheep are falling over dead and they just basically start to bring them up into piles and put them over into these things and bring the dirt back over them and that was the cheapest way they could do it they couldn't they weren't shooting the animals anymore they were just dying so many of them it was such a, a, a destitute situation it looked so dry and devastating because of a six-month drought, no water. And so when you look at that situation, a lot of times we don't realize, but that can happen in life, in society, in the world, people's relationships, their emotions, their lives are feeling so dry and they don't know what's going on. Tina Turner wrote an amazing song many years ago, and it, was, and it basically went like this. What is love got to do, got to do with it? What is love but a secondhand emotion? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? Now, that's a, that's a, a song that was, my mum used to love Tina Turner. There was a song that you know, really was, was coming out of a heart that was dry, a heart that was experiencing the dryness of life as it, as it is. And a lot of times, the heart is not meant to be broken. The heart was not meant to be a place of pain, of, of destruction. It was meant to be a wellspring of life. The Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Another way of saying it, abundance, great things. Things happen from the inner world of our mindsets, our heart, our core. And when we're in a place of, of, of life and expectation and hope and positivity, all of a sudden God is filling that realm and he's allowing good things to happen in our lives. And that's what we want for everybody on planet earth. <laughs> it says in John 10.10 10, in the New International Version, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That word full means abundantly, overflowing, surplus, profuse, more than enough, super abundance. And we think sometimes to have more than enough is greedy. Look at Jesus, more than enough love, 
more than enough life, more than enough forgiveness for 7 billion people on the planet. When Jesus makes lunch, he has leftovers. Has anybody had leftovers in, fridge, in your fridge? I love leftover night. You get to have all this stuff. You know what's coming. All the stuff you had this week that you enjoyed so much. You get to have more of it, overflow, more than enough. And so when Jesus made lunch, you know, the little boy brought his, 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 his bread and his fish and he broke it. There were so many baskets after the thousands had eaten. eaten. This is God's mentality. Not just give us just barely enough, you know, love, relationships, finance, healing, health, excitement, positivity. He wants more than enough. He wants so much more. So if I look a little excited today, I am. Because God's got more than enough for everyone in this place. Everyone online. He's got enough for 7 billion people. So let's start taking hold of the life he has for each one of us. And so love opens our life to others. Now, it's in, in the desert, we, my wife and I were out there, and, and we, when we first met, we, we'd hang out and talk a little bit. And one time she came over, and she was, came to my house, and we, I came out, and we were chatting, and she was on the front um, footpath, and, and it was in the desert, and it was dry, and there was, you know, the lawn was dead, and there's prickles and burrs and, and you know, spiky things out there. And, and we, we got into this little fight, little argument. I think it was Australian chauvinistic male meeting a, a strong Canadian female. Thank God for strong Canadian females. <laughs> now, she wasn't going to be taken over by some Australian male. So here we are. We got into a little bit of a clash. And so she's like not going to stand around putting up with this, are you girls? Now, she, she got up and walked right out. And she, uh, for some reason, she'd taken her flip-flops off. And she walked right out in the middle of the yard in the grass. And, and, and she starts squealing. And she starts getting very uncomfortable. And all the prickles that were in the lawn. They're really bad in there. And I'm standing there with a little smirk on my face. And she turns around and says, well, come and get me. Come and save me. Whatever. I said, you were the one walking away. And you know, that's what it's like. And I did go and get her. I went and picked her up, brought her back, pulled the little prickles out of her feet. And I was her hero. So I was the, um, uh, I don't know if I was a real hero. I was a little bit chauvinistic. But anyway, I had to get over that. And, uh, but that's the way it is. A lot of time on, in, on, on planet Earth, we walk away from our source of life. We walk away from everything good that we could have, and we find ourselves out in the prickles. We find ourselves in the thorns, in the dryness, in the pain, and the hurt. Who needs a heart when a, Tina Turner here, when a heart can be broken? <laughs> No, we weren't meant to live with broken hearts, pain, and suffering. God has more for us. He has so much better. And so God wants that. And the signs of, of dryness in, in, around believers and, and our people and, and, and people on planet Earth is, is sincere. You know, we lack of fellowship or sincerity in our relationships. You know, you sit next to someone at the movies or in church and you don't really focus on or even care. It's more like me. And, and so that, that's one part. Fear of, of, of other people. Fear of meeting new relationships or having people around your life, that, that's a part of dryness. It's always that scratchy feeling, a lack of faith or belief or trust in leadership or complaining and backbiting and you know, getting online and saying things about people that might be your friends. This is all signs of dryness in relationships. It says in Psalm 65 verse 9, the rivers of God never run dry. And we look at this, this word rivers, it talks about the, ble when you study that verse, it's literally talking about the blessings of God, the blessings in relationships, in, in business, in life, in, in any area of work. And wherever you're focusing your life at, it's the blessing of God. It springs forth. They never run dry. We should have more than enough. Am, am I sounding a little bit more excited than before? We should, and, but the thing is, is we, how do you get dry? You, God never turns it off. They never, you just walk away. You walk away from the life, and all of a sudden, there's, there's dryness. I looked up the, the meaning of the word die, quite profound, in, in the dictionary this week, and it said, when a person, an animal, or a plant stops living. <laughs> it is actually possible to stop living before you die. All you have to do is turn away from the abundant life that's given to us and we experience something less than his best. And God has so much more in store. Everyone say, so much more. Do I sound like a broken record yet? <laughs> he has so much more in store for us. And all we need to do to miss out is walk away from that. And so God is encouraging the whole of planet Earth 
through wonderful churches all over the planet, people starting to reach out and show that God is good. He's not a religious mean guy. He's just normal, loves us, wants more for us. And so we must understand, my wife is going to share with us a little bit today how each one of us can start to reach out and steward our love lives. This thing of opening up and embracing more of his love so we can literally love our life. We can enjoy this experience on planet Earth and not sort of kick stones and struggle, walk on prickles and have this pain and sorrow. We want life. So let's have a good time today. Let's say that this morning and say, I, I love my life. I love my life. And I believe that will become truer and truer as we continue to learn about God's love and the love that he surrounds us with and we begin to walk in that love in a greater way. And so how do we steward our love life? We've been looking at Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 9. Love others well and don't hide behind a mask. Love authentically. Despise evil. Pursue what is good as if your life depends on it. Live in true devotion to one another, loving each other as sisters and brothers. Be the first by honoring others, by putting them first verse 13 take every opportunity to open your life and your home to others we started last week talking about opening our life to others that God intends for us to have a, a life coming into us. God intends for his rivers to pour into us. God intends for us to not live a dry life. And he puts and he surrounds us by the right people so that we can thrive and we can grow. But we have to be the people who open our life. And so we want to talk about that today. How do we open our lives in love to others? And I want to discuss four different, very different, but very important friendships that you need in your life. The first one is a mutual friendship. This is where you're both at about the same spiritual level, you know, where you're, no one's really teaching anyone. You're kind of encouraging each other on the journey. You're walking side by side together, and you glean off of each other in this friendship. I believe that this is a very important friendship, and you need to have godly friendships in your life where you're recognizing we are journeying together. And how do you gather these godly friendships, these godly mutual friendships in your life? First, you know, obviously participate in a small group or be part of church gatherings and church activities. Proverbs 18 verse 1 says, whoever pulls away from others focuses solely on their own desires. The person who pulls away from others, the person who, who won't uh, allow themselves permission to have other people in their life, other friends in their life, it's because they're focusing strictly on themselves. But in focusing strictly on themselves, they miss out on what God wants to do. They miss out on the fullness. They miss out on the watering. They miss out on the life that God has in store for them. How do we get these friendships in our life? We talk to people. You know, one plus one's a great time before church, after church. Proverbs 18 verse 24 says, A man who has friends must show himself friendly. So, you know, you step out and you begin to meet people at church. Also, you begin to maintain the friendships that you have. You be loyal. You be reliable. You be trustworthy. Be available in the friendships, the Christian friendships that you have. I believe to have these Christian godly friendships, you have to prepare ahead of time to forgive. People are always going to let you down. Somebody's going to, you know, make a mistake. You prepare ahead of time to forgive. And you repair communications quickly. Miscommunications. When there's been a miscommunication between friends, you repair that quickly. And you have a heart that you genuinely want the best for the other person. This is what makes a godly friendship is that you genuinely, you want the best for that other person. You don't become jealous if they have other friends in their life. You know, you want them to thrive. You want them to grow. You want them to develop. And you want them to always be close to God and growing spiritually. So you avoid doing anything that would cause them to stumble cause them to falter, cause them to walk away from God, cause them to walk out of the path of God, because your heart in that friendship is, I want you to thrive spiritually. I want you to stay close to God. I want your relationship with God to be so close in your life. And I believe that as you have the right heart in these mutual friendships, what happens is you're, you water each other. You grow together. You enjoy life and God's fullness together. You cannot really truly love your life when it's just you. God has made us and, and designed us where we need 
people in our life. To live the full life, to live the, the best life that God has in store for us, we must allow other people into our life, and we need those godly mutual friends. The second kind of friendship I want to talk about is the mentor friendship. And this is where you yourself, you now, are going to pour into someone else. You're going to be someone who helps maybe a younger Christian along. You're going to help someone who's younger in the faith to grow and to develop. And the Bible calls it making disciples. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples. And so God has called every Christian to keep an eye out, to look for someone who's younger in the faith, someone who's just starting their walk with God, and now you begin to water them. You begin to teach them the word of God. You begin to encourage them and pray for them and love on them. And as you do that, you see that other person begin to grow and begin to thrive under your water. Now, most people are in a position that they say, well, I don't have it all together. When I get it all together, then I'll start, you know, helping a younger Christian. Can I tell you, if you're waiting till you have it all together, you're never going to do it. Because the day that you finally have it all together will be the day you take your last breath. You know, I mean, it's all done, boom, I got it all together and I'm going to heaven, right? And so you have to recognize that there are areas of your life that you do have it together. There are areas that you may not have it all together, but you have something to give. There is an area where you have grown, where you have developed in your relationship with God, and God has called you to water another person. God has called you to pour that on to another new believer. And so I encourage you to look for someone who's younger in the faith. Look for someone and begin to desire from them to grow and help them and encourage them and pray for them. Everybody needs somebody who's further along to encourage them and help them in the race they run for God. And you know, I want to encourage you to be a good leader. And I read a great quote and it says this, he who cannot be a good follower cannot be a good leader. So one of the greatest things you can do as you begin to pour into someone's life who's, who's younger in the faith than you is that you always show them that you yourself, you are still learning. You yourself are still being watered. You yourself have people who speak into your life who are helping to train and equip and to grow you as well. And when you show that and you model that, you yourself have now become a great leader and a great example to others. And that's the third friendship that we really need to embrace and love in our life is the mentee friendship. And this is where you have someone who's further along in life, and they help you. They teach you. They counsel you. They disciple you. They help you go to a new level. And the greatest thing about this friendship is that this is where you stop being stuck in a rut. Because somebody comes along your life, you open your life up, you let somebody speak into your life, you let somebody help you, and where you were once stuck, they now can help you get over that rut and get back in the game, get back in the game in that area of your life. And so I want to encourage you that everybody needs somebody who is in their life, who speaks into their life, who teaches them, and helps them grow to a new level. And this is what Jesus was to the disciples, and so I believe that we need those mentors in our life, but we actually have to open up to those mentors. We don't just, you know, say, oh, well, they'll just, they'll just kind of arrive at some time. We have to open our heart up and say, I want to be taught. I want to grow. I want to develop. You know, and you want to have someone obviously good who's going to help you, who's already been before you. They've kind of been there, done that, got the t-shirt, and they can help you journey and go further than you could ever go on your own. And so I have a few tips for picking a good mentor in your life. Be, number one is be clear on why you want to mentor. Figure it out in your own heart. What is it? Is it because I really desire to grow? Establish this relationship. Establish in the relationship what you're wanting to work on. No one can work on everything in their life at the same time. I've seen a few people, they kind of, you know, they write their 101 areas of their life that they're going to fix this year, and they just kind of go crazy, true? You can't work on everything at the same time, but you can work on a few things. So you establish, where are the areas I need to grow? And, and then you begin to establish that in the relationship with your mentor. You don't have to limit yourself to just one mentor. Many people need two or three different people in their life who are helping them grow in different areas. You need to establish your communication methods and Figure out how are we going to communicate? Are we going to meet face to face? Are we going to do it over email? Are we going to text each other? Is it going to be a phone call? How is this person going to be able to get a hold of me and speak into my life? 
You need to manage your expectations and realize that this person is going to be there for you to help you grow, but they are not going to be there for you 24-7. You know, they're not there to put every Band-Aid on every wound you ever have, right? And so, and so you have to have realistic expectations of, of how this person is going to be in your life and help you to grow. You want to make sure that, you, you know, with your mentor, that you, you pick someone who honors God first. You want to have people who speak into your life who put God first. And because if they don't put God first, they could lead you astray. And I've seen some great Christians who then get a mentor in their life who's ungodly, and it doesn't take long, and they're actually being led astray off of the very divine plan that God has for their life. And I can tell you that there are a lot of incredibly successful Christian people. And so you can get a hold of those people. You don't have to go to the world. You can go to the people of God and get a mentor in your life who can train you and teach you for your destiny and not lead you astray. You want to be respectful of your mentor mentor's time. You want to learn from your mentor's actions, not just their words. Some people have a lot of pretty speech, but where the rubber hits the road, they're not really living it. You want to be able to learn and glean from their life, you know, how their life is, how they treat their wife, how they, how they, you know, how they handle their money, what is their integrity. You want to be able to glean from who they are, not just the words that come out of their mouth. You want to be respectful of your mentor's time. If they have time for you, the last thing that you ever want to say is, none of those times work for me. You know, you want to you be open and understand that they're going to have a very busy life, and you take the bit of time that you can get from them. You want to be in a position that you do not get offended when your mentor challenges you. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 says, Be ready to spread the word whether, the t- whether or not the time is right. Point out errors, warn people, and encourage them. Be very patient when you teach. And so this is one of the things that a mentor will do in your life. God says they're going to use the word of God in your life. They're going to point out some errors. They're going to warn you where you may be, you know, detouring or, or missing something. And they're also going to encourage you. How many love being encouraged? This is so wonderful when you get encouraged. How many like it when somebody points out an error in your life? Okay, we got one. We got one in the crowd. Okay. You know, but everybody wants to be encouraged. But can I encourage you that the scripture says two out of the three things that a mentor is going to do in your life are going to be corrective. It says that they are going to come around your life. They're going to point out some errors in your life. It says that they're going to bring a warning to your life. How many know that people who have went before you can see the writing on the wall? They can already look ahead and say, I've been there. I've done that. I've been around life long enough. The writing is on the wall. The warning is there. And they're going to help you to be able to stay on God's path, to stay on that path of the fullness of life and not have to hit some of those major potholes in life. And it says that they're going to encourage you. And the word encourage means that they're going to deposit courage inside of you. In courage. They're going to put a deposit of courage in you. They're going to deposit that courage so you are now positioned to do something greater and something bigger than you ever thought was possible in your own ability because they're going to put a deposit of that courage on the inside of you. And it goes on to say that your mentor should be very patient when they teach you. Turn to the person beside you and say, I need a lot of patience. You know, you get, they're going to be very patient when they teach you. And we all need these people in our life. We need our mutual friends. We need people that we reach down to, that we disciple. And we need people that we reach up to, that they help make us better. They help train us to go forward. Also with our mentors, we want to ask the right questions. When you have time with your mentor, you want to ask the right questions. Don't ask questions that you can easily find the answer to on Google. You know, don't, don't waste their time. You know, if you can find it on Google, use Google. You know, it, don't ask questions that they've already given the answers to in the books they've written. You know, read the book, and then you don't have to ask that question. So you want to ask the right questions around people who are ahead of you. You recognize you're not going to necessarily get a lot of time. You want to make the time count by asking the right questions. I believe that if you have mentors and trainers in your life, then you will never have to post your difficulties on Facebook. You will never, ever, 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 ever have to put a post on Facebook again that says, this and this and this and this and this and this and this are all bad in my life. Somebody encourage me. You will never have to do that again. Because when you have that difficulty, you already have someone to go to. 
When you have that situation, you already know your go-to people, the go-to people who are going to give you the truth and the wisdom and point out the errors and encourage and point, put courage on the inside of you. You will never have to put that post again. Your post will always be a post of victory. And so I encourage you, everybody needs these people in their life. You need a mentor in your life, and when you have a mentor, you need to understand sometimes you're going to frustrate them. So have grace for them. Turn to the person beside you and say, I can be kind of frustrating occasionally. <laughs> right? So you've got to realize that you're going to frustrate them occasionally. Have grace for them. The same way that somebody else might frustrate you, you have grace for them if they seem a little frustrated occasionally. And you want to make sure when you have a mentor in your life that you express gratitude to them. You know, they will help you more if you are grateful. If you are grateful, they will give you more. They will help you more. They will be there more if you are grateful. And how can you be a grateful person? How can you be a grateful mentee? You need to do the homework that they give you. You know, they're going to tell you something to do. They're going to give you a little bit of homework. Actually do the, the homework that they give you. You need to say thank you every time that they give you some of their time. You know, you thank them. You pause and you say, thank you for the time you gave me. Thank you for praying for me. Thank you for speaking into my life. Thank you for giving me that scripture. Thank you for giving me that wisdom. You pause and you thank the people that are helping you to go forward. You thank the people who water you. Because if you thank the people who water you, guess what? You thrive. You grow. You develop. You need to remember special dates that are in their life and, you know, make sure that you're part of it. If they're, if they're celebrating, if they just got an award or there's something going on, you celebrate with them. You make sure that you're there to cheer them on as they're developing and going forth as well, too. If they write a book or there's something that comes out, read it. Grab it and read it. Don't just grab it and put it on the shelf. Grab it and read it. Be hungry to grow. And you make sure that you always sow back into their life, that you are never, ever labeled as a taker. That you recognize that if I'm a mentee and I'm growing from you, I will always give back. That I am not a taker. This is a, this is a relationship where, yes, you're helping to build me. But I always sow back into your life. I pray for you. I encourage you as well. You know, I, I sow back into your life because I want you to go further. As far as your mentors go, it opens a door for you to go further as well. You should cheer them on on every door that opens for them. Because every door that opens for them is a door that's left open for you to go through as well. And so we need those relationships in our life we need all of those relationships and the last relationship I want to talk about this morning the fourth type of a godly friendship I call this the maker friendship and this is your friendship with your maker you know we have a maker God is our maker and this is not fourth because it's least this is obviously first you know the most important relationship we have is the friendship we have with the very one who made us the very one who designed us. And Psalm 139 says this in verse 14 to 16. It says, oh yes, you shape me first inside, then out. You form me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God, you're breathtaking. Body and soul, I am marvelously made. I worship in adoration, what a creation. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made bit by bit, how I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I had ever even lived one day. See, it talks about that we have a maker. And it says that he formed us. And he made us, and he did a marvelous job when he made us. He did an incredible job when he made us. You know, he knew the right gift and the right personality and the right, you know, odd sense of humor, how to package it together in one person and make something that was marvelous, and that was you. And so many people are trying to find themselves. But if I can encourage you, it's not about finding yourself. It's about staying close to your maker who already knows you. He made you. He formed you. He knows you better than you will ever know yourself. So if you stay close in that friendship with your maker, guess what? You will find yourself. You will find out who you really are, who he has made you and created you to be. 
And so that relationship is the most important relationship we have. Romans chapter 9, verse 20 says, But my friend, I ask, who do you think you are to question God? Does the clay have the right to ask the potter why he shaped it the way he did? You know, most people are caught in a trap of wishing that they were like someone else. You know, well, why didn't God give me that gift? And why didn't God give me that talent? And why didn't God give me that personality? And why didn't God give me this? And it says here, does the clay have the right to look back at the one who made them and say, why didn't you give me this or why didn't you give me that? We have to recognize our maker he knew us. Our maker knew what was needed in our life for us to live the fullest life that God has for us, to live that abundant life. Our maker knew what could be packaged together, and it would be marvelous, and it would be awesome. Our maker knew what we were capable of. He already had a plan. He already had a destiny and a purpose for us. And if we will stay in touch with our maker, can I tell you, that is when life is satisfying. That is when we stop kicking against wishing that we were everybody else. Be glad that you are not everybody else. Have you ever, you know, you look at your spouse and occasionally you might see your spouse's weaknesses. Anybody ever looked at their spouse and seen a weakness in their spouse? And then you just look around at everybody else's spouses. And you get thankful real fast, right? You know, you're like, whoa, I, you know, I, really, I really got the cream of the crop here. And, you know, I mean, I'm just, aren't you glad that you're married to your own spouse? If you're married, you're, you know, you got the right one. Do you know, a lot of people look at everybody else's life and think, I wish I had their life. No, you will never be satisfied with someone else's life. You were made for the fullness of life. You were created for a full life just the way you are. And as long as your eyes are on somebody else's life, you will be frustrated and unsatisfied in life. But you stay close to your maker and you let him show you how he made you. You let him show you why he fashioned you the way he fashioned you, why he gave you the gifts that he gave you. You stay close to your maker, that friendship with your maker. You live the full life. You are satisfied on the inside with who God has made you to be. Because the Bible says that you are fearfully, you are wonderfully made. It says that he has made you and he put everything that you need to fulfill your purpose. It's already on the inside of you. People are looking out here. It's all in here. He has put it on the inside of you. And I believe with the right water, it comes out. It thrives. It grows. It develops. It springs forth with that right water. And one of that water is keeping close to your maker. I want to encourage you. We, we shared last week about the, the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven. The original translation is, my Father who is as close to me as the breath I breathe. The one who made you is as close to you as the breath you breathe. James chapter 4 verse 8 says, if you draw near to him, he's already right there. He's ready. He's ready to draw near to you. Don't ignore the very one who made you, who formed you, who designed you, who knows you, who has an incredibly crazy, awesome, good plan for you. Don't ignore the one who's fashioned you and made you incredible. Cut off every voice of everybody else who's told you what you're missing and lacking, and you listen to the voice of your maker. You listen to the voice of your maker who says, I have made you marvelous, and I have made you for an incredible plan. And that's what I want to encourage you with this week, is that all of those relationships, those four different kinds of friendships, they will water you. And that water, that water of the love from those relationships, it's going to help you grow. It's going to help you develop. And God has a good plan in store for you. So let's get ready for that good plan, allowing that water on our life. If you can bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment today. As you're watching with us online today, we're going to pray together in just one moment. And we're going to agree together as a community of believers. And as we do that, we're going to pray and we're going to believe for you as well. So wherever you are and you're watching this right now, we encourage you to activate your faith. Open your heart as we pray, you pray. Get involved in the community that way. And we're going to believe God with you that God is going to do incredible things in your life <laughs> as you stay close to your maker. And so this morning, I want to encourage you, if you're feeling distant from your maker, maybe, you know, you've had a little bit of that chip on your shoulder, like it talks about the pot, you know, you know looking back at the potter and saying, why did you do this and why did you do that? Maybe there's been a little bit of friction that you're saying, God, I wish you'd made me like somebody else. 
And yet God is looking at you with such an incredible love because he formed you perfect in his eyes. That God has such an incredible plan and he wants to lift your head. He wants to lift your eyes to see that incredible plan, to see the incredible goodness that he has deposited inside of you. But today, you have to draw near to God to be able to see that. We have to stay close to our maker to be able to see what he's put in us and what he has planned for us. And so this morning, if you're feeling distant from God or you're not feeling close to God this morning, I would love to pray for you. I'd love to pray for you, and we're just going to make that reconnection this morning. And so if that's you this morning, I just want you to lift your hand. Kind of give me a little bit of a wave that you need to do that this morning. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Fantastic. Flip down your hands. Thank you. Anybody else that you need to do that this morning? Okay, thank you. You can place down your hands. Anybody else that you need to do that? I want to encourage every person. Let's pray this prayer. Let's just make that reconnection as those who have lifted their hand. Let's reconnect ourselves to our maker. I believe this week God is going to show you incredible things about your life. I believe that your eyes are going to be opened in a new way to see what is on the inside of you that you have not yet discovered. I believe your eyes are going to be opened in a new way to see the good future that God has in store for you. And so let's reconnect today. I encourage every person to pray this prayer with me and say, God, God, Thank you. Thank you. For making me. For making me. I thank you. I thank you. You did a good job. You did a good job. When you made me. When you made me. And today. And today. I reconnect. I reconnect. To you. To you. I need you. I need my you. My maker. My maker. In my life. In my life. I thank you. I thank you. That today. That today. As I open my heart. As I open up my And heart, I open my life. I open my life. You're going to show me. You're going to show me. Things about myself. Things about myself. That I didn't know. That I didn't know. You're going to show me. You're going to show me. Things about my future. Things about my my future, that, I didn't know that I didn't know the good future, the good future that you have planned, that you for, have me. planned for me. And so today, God, so today, God I, love you, I love you and I choose you, I choose you Jesus, Jesus as the leader, as the leader and, the Lord and the Lord of my life. Of my life. And I thank, you, I thank you. Great things, great things are, to come are going to come in Jesus' name. Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Amen.